Anyway, it's wonderful to be here and uh, great to work with Jason again and his wonderful mother, Marilyn, who's the marvelous knitter, who's my personal fashion designer. <laughs> and great to be here in British Columbia and uh, Vancouver Island, which is really going to be one of my favorite places in the world. So. Uh, I feel like I don't take much credit for coming here because it's just purely selfish on my part. <laughs> um, you know, the, the reason for writing this book, you know, it's always a kind of a complex question about why you write a particular book, uh, why you write it all, which probably is um, some sort of obsessive compulsive disorder that psychology hasn't quite <laughs> named as such, but, um, but why you write a particular book at a particular time. And for me, when I write a book of fiction in particular, uh, it comes out of some kind of a deep question that I'm struggling with. Uh, I think that there are many things that fiction can do, uh, speculative fiction in particular, uh, and one of them is to wrestle with ideas and to wrestle with questions, not just on an intellectual level, uh, but on a level that in my magical training we learn to talk about uh, the level of younger self, the part of you that responds to images, to sense, sensorial cues, to emotions, uh, to stories. Uh, there's a way in which stories, I think, move us on a deeper level than just merely sharing your ideas about something. And uh, at the same time, I think in fiction, fiction suffers when it's written by someone who has answers. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have answers, I'll write nonfiction. <laughs> um, Maybe even nonfiction suffers from answers. You know, I think general writing works best with questions because a question is open-ended, and a question can lead you into territory that comes alive and takes on a life of its own. So in fiction, your questions become characters, and they become choices that those characters make, and they become actions, and they become a world that you set a story in. But long ago, when I wrote The Fifth Sacred Thing, uh, I had been writing nonfiction, and I had been doing a lot of research for years and decades on the old goddess traditions of Europe and the Middle East, and on feminist spirituality and ritual and magic. And one of the questions I was wrestling with that led to that book was, uh, you know, I had been studying the change from these very early matrifocal cultures in Europe and the Middle East that were not necessarily matriarchal, not like woman ruled, but matrifocal, like, you know, focused on the mother principle, focused on bringing life into the world, on this world itself uh, being sacred, and all the things that go along with that nature and the body and sen sexuality and all the life processes and the whole life cycle of birth and growth and death and regeneration being the sacred. And that all shifted, began to shift uh, in, you know, uh, the period roughly between about 3,500 and 1,500 BCE in Europe, um, with invasions of a more patriarchal, warlike groups of people, um, with a shift in culture from a focus on growth and um, sex and food, All, always good things, I think, to focus on, right? <laughs> Uh, to mythologies that centered around war and conquest and aggression. And you can actually see that change happen if you look at the myths in a place like ancient Sumer, 
where the early ones are all about the sacred marriage and there these celebrations of sensuality, uh, and then the later ones are uh, a shift to these myths about war, where actually you see the the later creator god Marduk actually creates the world by dismembering the body of Tiamat, the ancient goddess, the serpent uh, being that was the world. So. All that was running around my head for years, and I was quite, you know, the question I had was like, so how could it have been different? Like, how could a peaceful society resist violence without either becoming what you're fighting against or becoming conquered? And out of that, I started to write The Fifth Sacred Thing, where Northern California has become a beautiful, eco-feminist, balanced, diverse, you know, socially just society. Uh, and then Southern California has gone in the opposite direction and invaded the North. And the question is, how do they resist this invasion um, without losing what they are? Uh, and that story centers around three main characters, around Maya, who is the old witch and the storyteller, and uh, sort of the witness of this whole history that goes on. Uh, and her grandson, Bird, who is the healer. No, sorry, he's the musician who turns guerrilla fighter. And Madrone, who is the healer, um, who's Bird's lover and um, is uh, both a, a medical doctor and a midwife, but also a kind of shamanic healer, and her journey to find the power to counter the diseases, which are part of the biological weapons that the Southlands are using. Um, I don't want to spoil that story for you if you haven't read it, <laughs> but I will have, just in order to make sense of this one, you have to know they won, or they succeeded in throwing out the invaders, mostly by turning their army uh, against itself, by really subverting it and persuading most of the soldiers that they actually would have a better life if they ally themselves with the people of Califia, the people of the north. Uh, and Maya yeah. has a vision in the book where uh, she is told, tell your enemies this, there's a place set for you at our table if you will choose to join us. So when City of Refuge opens, um, the soldiers have joined them, uh, a lot of them, not all of them. Uh, and then the question is, what do you do with them? <laughs> what do you do with thousands of guys who have not been socialized to respect women or to respect other people um, who are, have not been educated, who can barely read and write, who know nothing about the world, um, who can't even eat regular food because the bread soldiers are raised on uh, basically sort of soy, pressed soy wafers, they call chips, and uh, alternating with sort of these things that are a little like Hostess Twinkies. <laughs> um, and, and for me, the question that really motivated this book um, actually came out, a lot came out of the Occupy movement. Uh, just read some people here that I met at Occupy uh, Vancouver, or like, when was it, five years ago? Is it really five years ago now? four years ago, yeah. Um, and the question is, like, how do we build the new world when people are so deeply damaged by the old? And that, for me, is the theme that runs through this book and uh, that kind of animates the characters in it and the, the choices and the questions that arise. Um, I think it's important you know, the title of this talk tonight is, What Would It Look Like If We Won? And um, 
for me, I think that's a question we often don't ask. You know, we live in these dire and crucial times uh, when so much is at stake right now. You know, the choices we make right now will affect the future of the world for generations and generations to come, ecologically and socially. Uh, and it's very easy to fall into fear and panic and gloom and despair. Uh, and maybe that's realistic. Um, but <laughs> I have a friend whose like, little email tag you know, always says, uh, pessimism is simply realism. <laughs> I always want to write her back and say, well, maybe at this moment in time, realism is a luxury we can't afford. <laughs> <laughs> because I believe we actually need hope and vision. Uh, we need to have a vision in our minds of what the world is that we want to create if we're going to have any hope at all of creating it. And there's very little in our culture proposing that. You know, there's uh, a whole lot of fiction and movies and, you know, TV series and you think about apocalypse or post-apocalypse or zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um, but there's not really much showing a positive picture of the future and particularly not here on Earth. You know, uh, maybe Star Trek is probably the most cheerful thing that's out there, but they're all out there in outer space. <laughs> uh, or Avatar, which had that beautiful planet, but it was a different planet. So what would it look like if we actually succeeded in the movements that we've been involved in for social justice, for environmental balance, for conservation for all those things that we want to do. Um, if we really succeeded in building community and creating community and creating a, a balanced world. And this is a, a core magical teaching too. If you think about magic as being the definition I've always liked for it is Dion Fortune's definition, the art of changing consciousness at will. You know, the art part about that implies vision and imagination. So what is the art of that? What is the imagination? What is the image in our mind? If you want to create something, um, the magical teaching about it is you need to have an image in your mind first of what you want, not just what you don't want. And then you put energy into that image and that energy begins to move forces toward bringing it into manifestation. And sometimes that can be extremely practical. <laughs> you know, if you want to eat dinner, <laughs> right, uh, you've got to have an image in your mind of like, uh, are you going to the noodle shop or are you going to the vegan restaurant? <laughs> and then you put energy in the form of going there or money as a form of energy or whatever it is and get your dinner. Um, you can't eat dinner if you're telling your, if you simply sit here saying like, well, I don't want McDonald's. I don't want Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want Italian. I had that last, you know, right? <laughs> You'll never get anything to eat that way. <laughs> it's the same like you can't, you know, you can't do a love spell by like <coughs> sitting out there under the full moon and going like, oh, great goddess Aphrodite, don't send me another rotten lover like the one I just got rid of. <laughs> because what you'll have in your mind is that rotten lover you just got rid of. Uh, there's a, a linguist, George Lakoff, who's written a number of books, a lot about um, language and politics. And he has one book called Don't Think of an Elephant. Mm -hmm. And he says, no one cannot think of an elephant, because as soon as you say elephant, the elephant's in your mind. So he says, if you're doing politics, you have to look at how, not just what the argument is, but how the argument is framed. You know, if the argument 
um, is uh, if you're talking about austerity as a frame, which the right wing likes to use, it's a metaphor, it's an overarching metaphor. And if you think about what the word means, you know, it kind of has somewhat noble associations. It's like about cutting out unnecessary frills and things that aren't really important and, you know, superfluous luxuries and focusing on just what is core and necessary. Um, and if we accept that frame and talk about, well, we want more austerity or less austerity, whatever, we've lost because that metaphor isn't really what they're talking about. What they really mean by austerity is things like cutting people's pensions that they worked their whole lives for, you know, and, you know, save for in good faith. Um, we could call that fraud. Um, they're talking about taking money away from people who have less money to give to people who have more money, you know. Um, they're talking about what we really could call neo-feudalism would be more accurate and would, um, you know, I think we'd be better off contesting it if we're talking about we don't want neo-feudalism because really it's going to be hard for people to say, well, actually we do want more neo-feudalism. <laughs> so, you know, the idea is um, it's one of those wonderful places where magic and politics intersect mm -hmm. is through language and through imagery and through metaphor. Um, but watch the metaphors, because if you accept the frame, then you have accepted the argument. And you can't win by doing that. You have to contest the frame, and you have to create your own frame and speak from your own frame. So for me, that's part of the importance of creating a vision. Because if we want to speak from our own frame, if we want to frame the world uh, into the wor world that we want, we have to have that vision of what it is. Um, and I think that is also one of the important things that fiction can do. Uh, in some ways, writing fiction is like extended trance visualization. It's like being in trance for years. <laughs> you kind of come out of it going like... <laughs> Oh, right. Do I still have a life? Like, oh, there's real people around here that aren't actually figments of my imagination. Like, <laughs> um, maybe I better pick up the shattered pieces of my life and go on and, you know, get out of this story, right? Um, it's a wonderful and terrible thing, you know, but uh, when you do envision something in fiction, you can do a number of things with that. You can warn. A lot of f fiction is about that. You know, that's the Mad Max and the post-apocalypse and the gloom and doom. You know, it can be really important to warn people about what could happen if we carry on the way we're carrying on. Um, but I kind of feel like we've done that. We know that. You know, we, we're overwhelmed with grim visions of what the future might be like. Um, it can also inspire. It can spark your imagination. It can show you an image of something you might want. And I think fiction can also, in some ways, be like a, a thought experiment. It can be a road test. It can be a way of trying something out and seeing if it can actually make sense at much less cost than actually doing it. Um, so for me, I, I like to do some of all of that. And um, what I'd like to do is read you f some of the passages here uh, that f I think show some of that vision of what it might be like if we won. And um, also have some time for discussions and questions and responses and reflections, because there's a lot of vision in this book. It ended up being a very long and heavy book. Not so much heavy, you know, like metaphorically, but like <laughs> actually. <laughs> I call it Starhawk Summer Reading and Weightlifting Program. <laughs> you 
can buy two of them tonight, and they're two and a half pounds, and you can really work those biceps, you know? <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to read, it actually originally came in the fifth sacred thing, and it was my attempt to put forth sort of the underlying values and the philosophy of uh, the vision of that city in the north. And it's called the Declaration of the Four Sacred Things. The earth is a living, conscious being. In company with cultures of many different times and places, we name these things as sacred, air, fire, water, and earth. Whether we see them as the breath, energy, blood, and body of the mother, or as the blessed gifts of a creator, or as symbols of the interconnected systems that sustain life, we know that nothing can live without them. To call these things sacred is to say that they have a value beyond their usefulness for human ends, that they themselves become the standards by which our acts, our economics, our laws, and our purposes must be judged. No one has the right to appropriate them or profit from them at the expense of others. Any government that fails to protect them forfeits its legitimacy. All people, all living things, are part of the earth life, and so are sacred. No one of us stands higher or lower than any other. Only justice can assure balance. Only ecological balance can sustain freedom. Only in freedom can that fifth sacred thing we call spirit flourish in its full diversity. To honor the sacred is to create conditions in which nourishment, sustenance, habitat, knowledge, freedom, and beauty can thrive. To honor the sacred is to make love possible. To this we dedicate our curiosity, our will, our courage, our silences, and our voices. To this we dedicate our lives. I'll read you a little from the beginning. A broken nose beauty, that's what we are, thought Madrone as she picked her way through the tangled maze of torn up trees and chunks of paving left by the steward's army in their latest invasion. Punched in the face, eyes blackened, lips split, but we're tougher than we look. We simply spit out a couple of teeth and go on. All around her lay the evidence of destruction. And all around her, as she wove her way through the tangle of paths and torn up gardens, teams were at work clearing away the rubble, digging new beds, pruning damaged trees. She stumbled on the deep track left by a bulldozer and came out onto a cleared space overlooking the grounds of the healing center. Before the invasion, the old brick building had been surrounded by lush gardens filled with herbs used to staunch wounds or treat illnesses, and flowers to refresh the spirit, for the medicine of the city integrated the ancient knowledge of root women and cunning men into Western allopathy, along with acupuncture and Ayurveda and the physics of the East. Now the plants were trampled, the ginkgo grove was a waste ground, and the myrtles and chaste trees of the women's grove overlooked a ruin of torn up tree of leaves and shattered stalks. The steward's army had taken a special delight in destroying gardens and uprooting sacred groves, as if beauty and abundance offended them. We chose not to fight with bullets, but to make beauty itself our prime weapon, the drone thought. Offering it to the invaders, beckoning, join us, become us, taste our fruits, until in the end the soldiers of the Southlands fell into our embrace and were undone. The worst damage was in front where the temple had stood, a pillared pavilion draped with fragrant vines. Here, where convalescents once had come to meditate in peace, where family and friends of the sick would bring their hopes and their offerings to lay in the niches dedicated to Hebe, Asclepius, Bridget, Mother Mary, or Kuan Yin, now lay a ruin of shattered rubble. But the temple was being rebuilt. As she did her healing work inside the wards, the work crews of the city would be healing the grounds and gardens outside. 
We are resilient, she thought. We'll use broken concrete as the base for new sculptures and benches to rest upon and melt down shattered glass to make new vessels. We use everything, even our injuries. So that's just a little glimpse of what, uh, you know, for me, healing is a big theme in the book, and I think healing is a big theme right now as we look at what's needed in the future. You know, we have a world that has been deeply damaged in so many ways, and yet there are great forces of healing and resilience that we can work with. One of the reasons why I love teaching permaculture, which is a whole system of ecological design, um, because it really tells people, hey, we have the capacity as human beings to meet our needs in ways that actually regenerate landscape around us and environment around us instead of destroying it. And we can look at climate change you know, not just as a matter of like numbers of carbon in the atmosphere, but if we look at climate change as a system of symptom of massive ecological dysfunction, then the cure for it is large scale ecological regeneration. And the, the hopeful thing is that we actually know how to do that. We actually have the capacity to do that can't necessarily put everything back the way it was, but we can take damaged land and toxic land and find ways uh, to bring it back into healing and into productivity and um, bring it back to life in ways that also help with climate change um, because when we're healing a damaged landscape, what we need to be doing is building soil. And when we're building soil, uh, we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and turning it into humus, which is a form of soil organic carbon. We're turning it into soil fertility. Um, we can do that the way nature has always done that, with plants and trees and grazing animals and microorganisms. And um, when we do that, we can actually take that excess carbon that's in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground where it doesn't have any you know, potential disastrous side effects. In fact, all of its side effects are things like repairing the water cycle, uh, helping the earth hold water more and helping the water cycle be more effective. Um, repairing the fertility of the ground, uh, restoring the life to the soil and the trees and the forests and the ecosystems. And we have a huge capacity to do that. And there are, are many places you can look at in the earth actually where that has been done. Um, so um, I think if we're looking at healing, then for me, healing becomes kind of a core image of what we need right now, healing and regeneration and restoration. And wouldn't it be like amazing if we all woke up tomorrow in a world where, you know how people were all so like gung-ho and together about, you know, World War II or you know, some great like massive project like that if we all woke up and said, like, wow, the healing has begun. <laughs> this is it. This is the time. You know, now the destruction is stopping, and it is time to begin the work of regeneration, and we all have a part in that. And we each have a part to play. Not always the same part, but we each have our own unique part to play. Uh, so, let's imagine that... Um, In doing that, we're going to need to also educate people. <laughs> and oh, what page? 
So uh, I'm going to read you a little bit about how the soldiers sort of start learning. No, that's the sex part. I'm sure you know. <laughs> I'll read you the sex part, but later. <laughs> ah, here we are. So um, everybody's all busy with the work of cleanup in the city. And um, among the defected soldiers, there's a soldier who in the fifth sacred thing was first called Onai, because the soldiers who have been bred for the army, they don't really have names, they just have numbers. And, um, but he, in that book, ends up being healed by Madrone and given a name, given the name of River. And um, you know, his real question in this book, he starts off by talking thing with Maya and saying, well, how does a breed get to be a real person? <coughs> And Maya tells him, um, well, by making choices. And his struggle is sort of like, how do I get to be real? How I've been bred to be nothing but a weapon, nothing but something that's been used by other people. How do I actually get to be a person on my own? <coughs> and so all the soldiers tend to be sitting around, you know, smoking and playing cards and watching while all the people from the city do the work. And River finally decides, like, why don't we join them? And uh, this is what happens when he does. <coughs> What's this for? He asks a young boy. We're building a raised bed so the elders can garden without having to bend and kneel. When we're done, we'll fill it with earth and compost. River liked that. He thought about Maya, imagined her down on the street planting a flower with her papery skin hands. The workers around him, he noticed, were mostly young teens and even small children. The adults were working on structures and buildings, leaving the garden repair to the younger ones. In the center of the garden stood a red sphere on a pedestal. What's that? River asked one of the older girls. That's Mars. She looked up at him, her dark straight hair framing an owlish face. What's Mars? Thick glasses hid her dark eyes. Her blouse hid new budding breasts, River noted, but he tried and failed to imagine how she would be in the rec room. Already she had the eyes of the Caliphian women, <coughs> looking straight into his with no fear nor submission, as if she were a person looking at another person, one she didn't think much of. It's our neighbor planet, she told him. What's a planet? She looked at him sharply, as if she suspected he were joking. We're standing on one. The Earth is a planet, like a giant ball circling the sun. Crazy shit. It's true. How come we don't fall off then? Gravity holds us on. What's gravity? Gravity is the Earth's love for her children, holding us close, she said, as if repeating something she'd memorized. Hey, Tubos, River shouted to his old unit. Come hear this. The girl called her friends over, and the children soon discovered that the soldiers knew almost nothing about the world. They had been taught to read, write, and count, mostly for the convenience of their commanders, but they had never been given storybooks or even textbooks on anything other than weapons and the simplest of military tactics. Their entertainment came from vid screens, vid games, and failing that, cards. They didn't know that the earth turned around the sun or that compost made soil. They knew nothing of history and were unaware that Caliphia and the Southlands had once been part of the same state, one of 50 in the same country. They had rarely seen the night sky before they made the long march to the north, and it hadn't occurred to most of them to wonder what those pinpoints of light in the heavens were. 
stars had to be explained to them. Help us rebuild this learning track, the girl said, and we'll teach you things. That's an order, 3-2 asked. The girl frowned. If you want to be, it's an offer. An order, River said firmly. The girl held out her hand. I'm Jasmine. What's your name? River. He took her hand and stood looking at it, not sure what to do with it or why she extended it to him. She grasped his, pumped it vigorously, and let it drop. These other chipsters here don't got names, just numbers, River told her. So what's this track thing about? It's how we learn here. There's different tracks that run all through the city with different learning stations. Right now, we're on the solar system track, and this is the Mars station. The next one out would be Jupiter and then Saturn. It's like a giant scale model. This ball is how big Mars would be if the sun were as big as the giant model of the sun that used to be in the central plaza. River and the other soldiers just looked at her, mystified. So Jasmine explained that on the solar system track, every planet had a learning station. Mars had its sphere, and around it were gardens with herbs that belonged to Mars, and flowers in martial colors, along with statues, war gods from many cultures, Ares and Chango and Thor. Each had a port for the intelligent crystals that the children wore around their necks. When they touched them to the ports, holograms jumped out with stories, myths, and explanations. They could listen to the Greek and Roman myths or hear the Scandinavian Eidas and then compare them to the Marvel Comics Thor and the movies. They could watch video from the early Mars rover or access the scientific reports from expeditions the scientists had mounted back when people could still do such things before the collapse. In their learning groups, they might delve further into the mysteries of space exploration or write and perform their own Mars space opera or read Mars-centered science fiction, or create a strategy game about Mars' expedition. River understood little of her explanation, but he gathered that the children had taken on the project of replanting the gardens and cleaning up the tracks, while the techies repaired the smashed electronics and the artist guild rebuilt the sculptures. In the end, Jasmine offered to meet them on the following morning, and take them to the outer planets that hadn't been damaged in the invasion. There they could see what a fully functioning station is like. So the children take on the task of educating the soldiers. And uh, at some one point, you know, Madrone kind of sees a whole group of children with all these like burly ex-soldiers wobbling around <laughs> uncertainly on bicycles and it's kind of like is this a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, but then she notices that, like, you know, all, that all around them are people who are just very quietly watching what's going on. Um, you know, someone's gardening, someone's standing in their doorway, you know, that there's always eyes on the children and that they're actually safe uh, without being like. Um, you know, overtly, suspiciously watched and controlled. Uh, and for me, some of that vision came out of really thinking about what would it be like to create cities where children are safe, you know, right? Uh, where children are free to run uh, all through the streets and explore, and where learning was about exploring, you know, and was an adventure, not you know, a matter of, you know, sitting in straight rows and memorizing things um, and being tested all the time. And, you know. and uh, I think it's, you know, very vital that we do think about things like what could education be like? Because uh, I don't know if Canada is as bad as the U.S., um, but in the U.S., it's become a very dire, you know, extremely controlled um, you know, it's all about testing, testing, testing. And it really goes back to a whole vision of the world uh, that says nothing is really real or important unless it can be quantified and measured. 
which is always a good way to control things and control people. Um, it's kind of core to the way we do science and technology now. Um, but it actually is, I think, a very soul-destroying view of the world. Um, it eliminates everything like imagination and creativity and joy and excitement. Uh, and it's not turning out kids that are uh, excited about learning and excited about critical thinking and um, or actually what it's doing is it's increasing this divide where you get kids who've gone to the private schools and who've gotten the enrichment and gotten the arts and gotten the drama and gotten uh, you know the extras who are tremendously bright and know a tremendous amount of the world, and then you get this whole other strata of kids who really know nothing. So in some ways, the soldiers in here are like the, that process taken to the extremes. Uh, and I think to counter it, we really need to mm. have a lot more imagination about what we're pushing for in terms of education. Um, so there's my little rant on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which brings us to the question of technology. Um, and economics. So, you know, in the fifth sacred thing and in City of Refuge, um, they have you know, they're in the north, they're very much ecological, nature-centered. They've torn up the streets to plant gardens and all that. But they're also very technological. But their technology is based on a different premise than, you know, today's technology comes out of this view of science that says, again, nothing is real but what can be quantified and measured. There is no consciousness or soul that can be taken into account when we're doing science. Right? Uh, in my lovely fantasy world, <laughs> it is like, they said, well, what would science be like if it admitted consciousness? You know, if it was, what technology be like if it admitted that there were different kinds of awareness? What if instead of thinking of our computers as being made of like a bunch of dead, non-alive parts, uh, we thought of them as crystals that had a consciousness of their own that we need to cooperate with and sort of woo into cooperating with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Personally, that is kind of how I experience technology. <laughs> it's, you know, like, you know it's, it's like, please, please, computer, turn back on again. <laughs> I'm sorry I offended you. Like, I'm sorry I like carry you around my backpack without turning you off. I'll never do it again. <laughs> um, so. Uh, there's another character who was a minor character in The Fifth Sacred Thing, Cress, uh, who was in that book very, very angry all the time and really, you know, sort of uh, pushing for armed struggle and not committed to all the nonviolent stuff that they do in The Fifth Sacred Thing and didn't really believe in it. And uh, in The City of Refuge, he finally kind of gets his way. He goes with the Army of Liberation back down through the Central Valley where he was actually from, where he was raised, and uh, where he had a very traumatic experience as a child when in the collapse with the earthquake and the everything collapsing and his mother and sister dying. Yeah. Uh, but he gets to go down there with the army and becomes kind of a commander. And at one point, the techies decide that he should go with them on one of their little techie trips where they actually sort of go into a technological trance and infiltrate 
the computer, the captured computers of the enemies in the Southlands to see if they can hack them in a sort of shamanic hacking way. <laughs> <laughs> So here's just a little piece of uh, Cress's experience in the bowels of the computer world. <laughs> on and on they went, trackers on the hunt, until they reached the heart of the glow and found another pulsing, singing globe of light. This too was composed of multiple intertwined filaments, and the techies dove in without hesitation pausing only now and then to reel off a string of numbers, down through one nexus to another and another, until Cress felt as if they'd been speeding through eternity, globe within globe, cord within cord, world within world, down and down forever. And then they were facing a hard-edged glowing crystal. It beamed out a brilliant white light that broke into rainbows across the prisms of the crystals that surrounded them. Cress and Techies were six globes of light, in a chamber studded with crystals like the heart of a geode. Their reflections in the facets sent rays bouncing and zinging around them, giving off pure tones like a celestial caroline. Cress looked at his five companions. They too were knots and tangles of filaments, harmonies and melodies, each one a million times more complex than the nodes they had explored. Was he like that, he wondered? He sensed that the techies were showing their minds to the crystal heart. They were speaking not so much with words, but in images and tones and bursts of emotion. Suddenly, he felt himself on display. The other lights dimmed around him, and he could see rays spreading out from his own center, some of beautiful bright colors, others the clotted dull red of blood or pain. Well, that's who I am, he thought, a little ashamed. I didn't choose that pain. It chose me. He was a chord, a song, the deep tones of his grief, giving weight to the blue rippling notes of flowing water. He had wanted to be a musician once. Bird had actually encouraged him to apply to the musician's guild. He felt a flash of anger, remembering Bird's smug smile, his unquestioned assumption that he, of course, was in position to judge. But music was a luxury, Cress had believed. Water was a necessity. Was that really it? A little voice whispered, or were you afraid, afraid to be rejected, afraid of having to display your talent and falling short? Fuck it. He didn't need Bird or anyone else to tell him whether he was good or not. His anger, his resentment, and yes, he admitted his jealousy wove around him like dissonant chords, shrill and grating, so different from the sad but beautiful tones of his grief for Valeria and his child, his older grief for his mother and sister. This was like a needle scratch on an old-fashioned record, setting his teeth on edge. He wanted it to stop. Then why do you keep digging it deeper and deeper? Why do you worry it over and over like a sore tooth? Was that the voice of the crystal or some voice of his own? Some half-remembered admonition of his mother's? Was he getting lessons in forgiveness from a fucking machine? <laughs> but he could let it go, he realized. After all, he and Bird were not in competition. He had turned his life to the service of something far more primal and vital than music, and he could do things that Bird could never do. He could bring dead land to life. And with that thought, the screech died away, and instead he heard the roar of a river in flood, the liquid notes of an ocean-bound rushing stream, the quiet chant of still pools sinking into parched land. So... Yeah. So, what would the economics be like? <laughs> How would we run an economy? Um, the Army of Liberation manages to liberate a bunch of debt slaves who are in one of the plantations in what's left of the Central Valley, growing food for the Southlands. And um, 
Cress again and some of the others are explaining um, the economy of the city to them and what's going to happen to the people they've just liberated. If we stay and farm, Judith is one of the freed debt slaves called out, how much will we owe on the land and the seed and the fertilizer? How much are you going to charge for water? Cress step forward. Water is free. Water is one of the four sacred things that can't be owned. Earth, air, fire, and water. Where the army of liberation passes, all debts are canceled. The freed workers stared blankly at each other for a long moment as if they couldn't quite comprehend what the words meant. Then Judith began a tentative cheer that slowly grew stronger as other voices took it up. All debts are canceled, Cress was saying, but we will need your help. If we succeed, we'll cut off the stewards' food supplies, but we'll need something to take their place. We'll ask you to grow more than you need to feed yourselves so that we can liberate the Southlands, not starve them to death. So what you're saying is that we'll pay off our debts with food production, Judith said. We don't have debts in the North, Cress went on. Our economy is labor-based, not monetary. What the jism does that mean, asked a hard-bodied man <laughs> with angry eyes. Spent a lot of time thinking up, you know, new sorts of profanity. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> it means you get credit for your work. We all work and we work hard, but there are no slaves and no masters. How's that possible? An older woman asked. You put in your hours every week, and they get credited to your account. You need more than your basic stipend. Everyone gets credits to cover their basic needs, like food and shelter. You draw on your account, Cress told her. That can't add up. What about cheaters? What if you can't work if you're sick? So slackers get to do nothing? Burst of questions and exclamations rose from the crowd. Cress blinked. The hot sun was beating down and sweat dripped down into his eyes. The corpses littering the ground were beginning to stink and flies buzzed around them. I tell you what, he said to the crowd. How about we bury the dead and make ourselves some shade and filter some water and then we can sit down in comfort and discuss economics. And I imagine you'd all like something to eat and drink. When at last their immediate needs were met, they crouched together under the shade cloth that was affixed to the north side, one of the double wides. Much to his relief, Cress found a young economic student in the, in the ranks. Salim was delighted to hold forth to a fascinated crowd. Our unit of value is the calorie. We analyze everything by the amount of energy in it, embodied energy both from natural resources and human labor. Work is organized by the guilds, yes, you could cheat on counting up your hours, but your guildsmates would know, and all the records are open. And you can't cheat that much because there are only a finite number of hours in the day. Salim was young and filled with enthusiasm for his subject. Cress watched him, realizing how sleek and moist and well-fed he looked with his dark, shining eyes and even teeth. Next to him, the crowd of former debt slaves looked like shriveled, dried-up husks, their fever-bright eyes too big in their shrunken faces. They stared at Salim with a glazed look, hardly fathoming what he was saying. He could have been speaking Chinese. We don't encourage people to store up credit, Salim said. We want to keep them circulating because they represent productive, regenerative work, and there's a lot to be done. But what about saving your money, an old crone asked. Don't you want people to save for your own age? You don't need to save for your old age because you'll always get your basic stipend and it increases every year after you hit 60. You don't need to save for disasters because we meet them together. If you get sick or injured, if you need medical care or help at home, all those hours count towards someone's credits, but they're subtracted from the city's totals, not from yours. Medical care is free. Nursing is free. Education is free. Some work groups, like doctors or healers or artists, get a stipend instead of counting hours, as their work doesn't lend itself to keeping track of time like that. That's crazy, objected a young blonde man, whose mouth gaped with missing teeth. How can you afford it? How can we not afford it? 
Salim grinned and waved his arms expansively. The better we educate our youth, the more productive they'll be over a lifetime, and the more we will have for all. When your system says they can't afford it, he went on, what they really mean is they can't afford to forego the profits they make on the compounded interest of all those loans over time, and that's partly because they are making virtually nothing of true value anymore, mining the natural resources, using them up instead of conserving and regenerating them. Every hour of your labor on this land degrades its value. But our agronomists and soil scientists and permaculturalists will come down here to heal the soil and replant, and every hour they spend will build topsoil and increase the Earth's ability to produce. That's the real interest on our investments. <laughs> So, I suppose you want to hear a little bit of the sex scene. You know, again, part of the, one of the themes I like to explore in fiction is, again, the idea of what would the world look like if we actually believed sexuality was sacred? which, of course, is one of the core things in paganism and goddess religion and many earth-based and indigenous traditions is the understanding that it's sexuality is life force and it's something sacred and it's meant to be a healing force. Um, but I actually think that um, there's very, very little, again, in fiction or in mythology, current mythology, or in, not ancient mythology, but, you know, popular culture mythology, or movies, or anything that actually shows sexuality in that way. So, I feel it's a personal, you know, one of my personal crusades, you could say, <laughs> to try to explore some of those aspects of what it might be like. Uh, so, Here's River, again, our defecting soldier, walking through the city when he encounters, uh, it's an interesting encounter. <laughs> so the people around him, they were worth looking at. They like to costume themselves up in bright colors and decorate their skin with elaborate tattoos. The women always had fresh flowers in their hair, and the men too, for that matter not to mention the ones you couldn't tell was a man or a woman or an in-between. That woman in front of him now, with her red hair flying like a flag in the breeze, and her little apple cheek butt twitching left, right, <laughs> left. Be nice to have an hour with her in the rec room. But city women were off limits. Bird had explained that carefully to him. If they want you, he'd said, they'll approach you themselves. You try, you're likely to get an eye gouged out. He sighed. A soldier has needs, and he was aware of his. One good thing about the army, always a rec room down the hall in the barracks, so long as he wasn't on punishment detail, he could meet those needs. Now, it was complicated. But watching the red-haired woman, he began to wonder what it would be like to have a filly who wasn't a pen girl, who maybe had made her own choices, who chose him. Suddenly, the woman ahead of him stopped, so abruptly that he nearly bumped into her. He stopped himself just in time, conscious of how near their bodies were, how they had almost met. Sorry, he said. She turned and scrutinized him closely. Now he could see her face, ivory covered with freckles. Her small, pert mouth seemed to be holding back a smile. She had some kind of squiggly shell tattooed on her forehead, and her gray eyes were cool, assessing him. You were looking at me, she said. I could feel your eyes. Couldn't help it, you right in front. She gave him a long smile of appraisal. Do you consider yourself a brave man? She asked in a low voice with a purr in it, almost like a cat's. River stared at her, confused. Nobody called the spider a coward. She tossed her long hair on the breeze and slowly undid the top button of her diaphanous blouse. How brave. River gulped. He was suddenly terrified, although he didn't know <laughs> 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 
she undid another button. He didn't know what to do. The curve of her breast drew her, his eyes like a tractor beam, and he couldn't seem to pull away, even though he thought maybe he should. But they were in the middle of a public street. People could come by and see her. Didn't she mind? Didn't seem to. What was he supposed to do? Well, her smile deepened as if she were amused at his discomfort. She looked him up and down. He could feel the hot swelling in his trousers, and her eyes lingered on it thoughtfully. It grew under her gaze. <laughs> Has anyone ever taught you the art of love? She asked. Don't need no teaching. Natural. Eating is natural, yet fine cooking requires knowledge, she said, not smiling now, but serious. How would you like me to take charge of your education? <laughs> River felt a deeper sense of panic. What was she proposing? Uh, on my way to market, got to get some fresh fruit, he hedged. I can give you peaches and ripe strawberries. <laughs> She did purr now, and her breasts rose, the nipples hard under her breasts, blouse, and thrusting forward as if they were the fruit she offered. Unless you're scared. Never been scared, no filly. She held out her hand. Then come, let me take you to the temple of love and desire. Who are you? River held back, still suspicious. I am a devotee of Aphrodite, mistress of love, and a priestess of Oshun, goddess of the river. River, my name, he told her with some pride. I know, she nodded. Now let it be your destiny. <laughs> well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, which goes on for like probably far. I <laughs> do. <laughs> but I. <laughs> But I will read you one other section a little later on. Yeah. It is, it's a long sex scene, and uh, probably, <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably I should have cut it way down because it doesn't really advance the plot of the story. <laughs> well, it does, but you know, but <laughs> I figured since I ended up self publishing this, like, I could indulge myself. <laughs> <laughs> Call it the flower, the red-haired priestess said. She sat before him, her legs spread wide. And here, these are the petals of the flower. And this, this is the hidden jewel in the lotus. And now I will show you the different ways you can polish the jewel. <laughs> you will watch first, and then we will practice. For today, you will learn to be a giver of pleasure. And so his instruction began. Throughout that long day, he learned all the pleasure points of the body, hers and his own. She taught him the many ways to touch and stroke, to pulse and vibrate, to sniff and taste, how to read the signs of arousal, how to alternate the delicate and the strong like the movements of a symphony. After the first hour, a dark-skinned young man came in and began to demonstrate possibilities of the male body that River had never imagined. He watched, breathing through his own arousal, and then he did what he was shown, rewarded when he did well by her quickened breathing, his gaping mouth. He received no touching back in return. The time to receive would come. They limited him to hands and mouth, for they said when the time came to use his shaft, he would be giving and receiving at once. From time to time they tested him, Stop, they would cry out, and he was expected to stop that instant, whatever he was doing. And once he failed to do so, they simply left the room, leaving him alone for half an hour. When he did, he was praised and rewarded by being allowed to give some more. No one had ever told him that pen girls were supposed to receive pleasure or indeed were even capable of it. They were there to service the soldiers, receptacles, not partners in love but to give, to see her eyes grow misty, her breathing heavy, her flower open to his touch, filled him with a sense of power. He was real, her gaping lips proved it. You are a giver of pleasure, an artist, a god, they whispered, and he began to believe them, giving and giving until he knew that giving was receiving, until the tides of pleasure rose within him and could not be content.
<laughs> well, maybe we better ground that out with one paragraph of permaculture. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Chris, uh, as they go through the Central Valley and they finally reach the end, um, he's looking back on it and this was the dry, cracked land he was born in. Whole sections had collapsed into sinkholes from the quakes and the emptying out of the water table below. Vast stretches had become barren badlands and even the flat and featureless plain that still supported agriculture was salted and dying from the poisons with which the stewards drenched their fields. Yet he remembered his father telling stories of the days when the air was clear and you could see the high Sierras rising up in the east. He remembered the play of the wind in the fields, how they would ripple like the waves of the sea, tossing the light back and forth like foam. He was a man of water gill. He could feel the waters retreated now deep below the earth, crying out to be replenished. His vision rippled and he saw how the land could be gently carved with swales and berms to capture every scarce drop of rain, to guard and cherish every dribble and fuse every trickle back into the earth. Then once again, springs would well up and vernal pools harbor delicate ephemeral wildflowers. Wetlands would form with cranes and herons coming to feed and wild geese resting on their long migrations. Shelter belts of fruit trees and nut trees would enclose green fields, and on the hillsides, meadows would clothe themselves each spring in brilliant tapestries of wildflowers, pink and orange and blue. Free farmers would till rich soil restored to health, dark and alive and fertile, and their children would swim in blue jewels of lakes and feast on peaches and almonds, free and unafraid. And he was crying suddenly, hugging a rock in the red gold light of the dying sun. Under this land lay his mother and sister, and nothing he could do would bring them back or ease the terrible thirst of their passing. But he could bring water to their graves. The rage and drive that had fueled him for so long seemed to sink into the land like the runoff from a storm, leaving him spent and tired. Tired of the raiding, the killing, the fear of being killed. Tired of that edge where fear disappears into a kind of silent clarity where everything slows and the whole world seems outlined by a cold blue light. Bored, even. They had reached the end now. From here, the rounded hills rose up and then tilted up into the steep sides of mountains, range after range of them until they opened out into the broad valley surrounding Angel City. A climb and a last push, a final battle, or more likely weeks or months of fighting house by house and street by street. But in the end, the Southlands would be free. Once he had lived and breathed for that day. Now he simply felt weary. What he craved now was only the land and a shovel to sculpt it into an open hand, cupped to receive and cherish water. So, <laughs> I'd love to open it up for your questions and comments now, and I would just ask you to remember to be sure to use the magic talking stick. <laughs> which will allow your words to go out into the universe and be heard by uh, all the other people who are out there listening that we can't see. Anyone have a question, a comment, a personal vision you want to share? Hi. Hi. <laughs> I've read a lot of your nonfiction work, and I haven't actually, this is the first time I've heard you read fictional, mm -hmm. your fiction work. 
Um, I'm wondering what you, how you find the process of writing nonfiction versus fiction and just the differences in your own journey with that. I find it's a very different process. Um, with nonfiction, I generally start out with an idea, um, sometimes with an answer, but usually with an idea, and it's much more sort of in the head process. Um, I'll often do a lot of research on it, uh, a lot of reading of other people's ideas that relate to it, a lot of thinking about it. And then it's a process of sort of organizing it and writing it. And um, it's, um, you know, it is emotional, but it's not, it's primarily sort of a, a heady kind of process. <laughs> Uh, it's also something I can do in little bursts and, you know, do a bit here, do a bit there. Once I have an outline for something like uh, the Empowerment Manual, which is the book I wrote before this, which is about group process and group dynamics for collaborative groups. You know, I could write a chapter, I could write a section and go away and write another section. With fiction, it's much more having to sort of immerse myself in the world. And so I try to create longer stretches of time where I can not be traveling for a few weeks or a month. And um, I'll wake up in the morning and write um, until I run out of steam, usually in the middle of the afternoon, and then go out and walk or do something else. But uh, I really like to not have a lot of people around to talk to um, not have a lot of interaction. I don't turn the internet on until I'm done writing for the day. It's my one, pri my prime piece of advice for anyone who wants to know how to be a writer. <laughs> it's like, don't turn the internet on <laughs> until <laughs> you're done writing for the day. <laughs> you know. I'll often go to bed thinking about the characters and dream something or wake up in the morning with uh, a dream about them. And uh, it takes you over and much more, it's a much more emotional pro process. Uh, I usually write, like I'll write a first draft that's pretty much uncensored, where I'll just sit there and just write whatever comes to mind. Um, I don't, I'm not one of those writers that has a clear outline of everything that's going to happen before I start writing. And then I'll start structuring it and putting it together on the second draft and then start refining it on the third draft. And often the really nice pieces of writing don't come until the fourth or fifth or tenth or fiftieth draft. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the, my favorite little bits of writing in here actually didn't come until after it had been edited and was being copy edited and the Kickstarter was running and I was like, this is the last moment before it goes to press. <laughs> I need one little thing here. <laughs> and you're actually 147 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I will say that there were times when I would like you know, sit there writing something and reread it and be sitting there like sobbing away, kind of going like, I hope nobody walks in now. <laughs> <laughs> sobbing away, you know, at my own writing and kind of like hoping no one walks in on me. <laughs> I, I love that one of your first examples uh, tonight was the uh, children building garden beds for elders mm -hmm. to work at, and um, it's it's a project I'm familiar with funding through the work that I do, mm -hmm. and there the myriad expressions of what we want of how this looks when we win are are all around us, and I guess my question rotates around um, um, the how to. And, and how you've seen this in in San Francisco or other places, how the blessed unrest that is mm -hmm. uh, unfolding all around us can stay connected and uh, and expressed, um, and instead of being defined as the other or the alternate or you know mm -hmm. the the marginal, um, because increasingly, 
it, it's not. It's, it is manifesting. You know, I think there's been a huge urban gardening movement that has started up in the 20 years that have passed since writing the first book and this one. And that's been very exciting to see. And, uh, you know, everywhere you go, there are community gardens now, there are farmers markets, there's a big urban food movement and local food movement and movement to, you know, for organics and for just restoring some of the traditions around food growing and food raising that I think are uh, really, really hopeful. Um, you know, in San Francisco, and I've seen it some places in like Vancouver and Victoria driving around, like, you know, there have been places where they actually did start digging up parts of the street and uh, planting them now and they've got like curb cuts and stuff to capture runoff so it's growing these rain gardens instead of just going into the gutters and you know there's a lot of really really wonderful things like that san francisco and the bay area of course the art and the mosaics and the creativity has been you know is amazing there and you walk down the street sometime and you're like every you know, every house is a painting or an art gallery. But the downside is, you know, I think the big question we have to solve is that then what has happened now is that the city has gentrified so fast and so quickly and become so incredibly expensive that all the wonderful artists and gardeners and activists and organizers are, and all the ordinary people <laughs> are being pushed out. And uh, I mean, I think that is one of the really crucial issues that we've got to organize around and solve because if, you know, when I moved to San Francisco in the 1970s, you know, you could live there and work part time and have time to develop an art or write or organize something and you know that got harder and harder to do but was still possible to do now it's impossible if you haven't already you know if you didn't buy a house there 30 years ago you know it's absolutely unbelievable you know studio apartments renting for four thousand dollars a month you know, you know, unless you're working in the tech industry uh, or the marijuana industry, <laughs> you know, there's like, <laughs> you know, like, it's the only people that can live there are either working in dispensaries or <laughs> working for Google, you know. and everybody else is getting kind of pushed out of the city, and so people all moved over to the East Bay and went to Oakland, and now Oakland's getting so expensive, people can't live there, and then you get these places, these urban centers that have been these great generators of art and ideas and innovation and, you know, political activism, uh, and you get the heart eaten out of them, uh, I think it has a really devastating effect on the future and what can happen. So we really need to address the issues around housing and the cost of housing. Um, and young people, you know, can't move out of the house. And then parents are stuck with them forever. <laughs> 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 and old people, I mean, I know, you know, many w older women my age and older who've lived in the Bay Area for their whole lifetime and then can't afford to live there anymore. And, you know, then you're in old age sort of stuck with like, well, what do I do now? You know. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's a really crucial part of the vision that we've got to address. And I think there are ways that it can be addressed. You know, um, I was talking about Amsterdam where the city owns the bulk of the housing. And the idea of housing is to house people, not to be 
Yes, you know, where the city has a lot of houses and they're not exactly like the projects we have where, you know, which are sort of the last resort, but they're, you know, for lower middle income people, um, you know, and it, it creates a mass of um, moderate priced housing that remains in the city. So you can have, to have a viable city, you've got to have a range of um, price range in housing so that younger people can get established, so that um, poor people can live there, you know, so that people who are successful can stay there without having to move out to the suburbs or somewhere else. Um, but, you know, you have a city where, you have a city where none of the, you know, where doctors can live there, but the receptionists in their office can't, and you know, nurses can't, and teachers can't, and cops can't even, you know, and firefighters can't. Then you don't really have a real viable city anymore. You've got something else. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, talking stick. Um, thanks very much. I just sort of similar to what you were talking about. I recently moved here from Vancouver, and um, I wondered if you can comment because I've noticed there that, and as much as I love ur ur urban gar gardening and permaculture and think it's really important, and I'm partly a farmer, um, I've noticed that it's really easily it's it's not all it's not necessarily challenging to those in power. Um, and it seemed to have been really easily incorporated into mm -hmm. the gentrification project in Vancouver. So we've got great farmers markets, but most of them offer $10 bread. So mm -hmm. um, I just wonder if you can comment on that dynamic of how, um, how urban gardens and permaculture can, can stay grassroots and also how that can, can be more of a challenge to structures of power. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, in our lovely capitalist system, uh, almost everything becomes incorporated <laughs> into the project of making things more profitable for some people. Um, you know, I, where I've seen urban gardens be challenging um, is kind of in the sense of our people able to use them to, in some way, take control of their own lives, their own food production, the, to create jobs for themselves, um, to counter some of that massive corporate food system. Um, can the urban garden movement also be allied with the anti-Monsanto and the anti-GMO movement? and? the movements to counter that kind of industrial uh, farming and pollution. Um, because just having beautiful gardens, although it's a wonderful thing to have, <laughs> yeah, um, doesn't necessarily mean that the system is going to change. Um, the other place where I've really seen it make a difference has been some, you know, like there was a street in San Francisco in the area that, uh, has been the highest crime area of the city, uh, where people really got tired of the drug dealing and the crime and that. And they got together and they created an urban garden. And they created a uh, gathering space and planted it and shifted the energy so much that it shifted the crime out of that area. And they took back sort of their street. Um, Mark Lakeman from City Repair in Portland, Oregon, has done some wonderful work. And he's going to be up here next weekend at the course we're teaching at our Eco Village uh, around placemaking and around creating gathering places in the city. And um, you know, when, a, when an urban garden also becomes a place where people can get together and actually build real community, 
and actually like have the conversations about what's going on in the city and what we can do about it and how we can organize around it, then I think it becomes a place where some of that real challenge can happen. One of the things that I think about a lot is how there's so many people working on so many different parts of this, of these issues, you know, um, <clears throat> and they all have validity and, and import. Often when I look at some of these processes, I, I know people that worked on, you know, um, forestry issues at British Columbia for a really long time, and what happens is, you know, we won the Clayquot battle 20 years ago, and they just kind of put it on a back burner and then it cycles back through and they wait till we're disinterested or we've mm. moved on to other issues and then it kind of, next thing you know, it's clear cut and they push it through again. So I, I've come to feel like without addressing economy and politics, mm -hmm. most of the other issues seem subservient to those issues and, and it feels maybe not a waste of time but poorly sequenced. Mm. You know? um, and I noticed that when we you know, when we all came together kind of against <coughs> Stephen Harper, for example, um, there was tremendous collective weight and significance and everyone kind of clued into how important this moment was. And I, I wonder a lot about um, the need to find the specific inflection points, you know, the specific leverage points that make the biggest difference. Because I, I often feel like in activism and in our work, we go broad instead of deep and we have too many people working on too many different things instead of saying, right now, the only thing that any of us should be talking about is, for example, proportional representation in mm -hmm. Canada, and that we shift the, the democratic system, or whatever, th whatever the thing may be. But I, I wonder what you would speak to that in terms of both the sequencing and maybe the shared focuses instead of these broad focuses where we're all working on so many different issues. You know, I think often uh, people on the progressive side and on the left are not very good at strategy and doing strategic thinking. On the right, you know, they've got like well-funded think tanks where they've got brilliant minds that do nothing but sit around all day thinking up like, you know, how do we mess up the world more effectively? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't have a lot of those. Uh, I think it'd be great if we did. If somebody, you know, some billionaire listening out there wants to fund one, I'd say, yes, we could use some. Uh, but without that, I find that even in our own personal lives, I know I'm guilty of this, we get, s it's so demanding to just keep up with what's happening and what the next thing is and the next thing is, it's hard to even pull back and make time get together with our friends and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a memorial for Grace Lee Boggs. I don't know if any of you know who she is. She is a wonderful organizer uh, from Detroit. And she and her husband, Jimmy Boggs, had a center there where they did a lot of great organizing for decades and decades. And uh, she died this year at the age of 100. Mm -hmm. uh, and very inspiring. Uh, and one of the things she and her friends used to do was they'd go off for a month every summer to a cabin in Maine and just sit around and have conversations. And I thought, like, you know, for me, her legacy is to prod me to take more time to have more conversations uh, and to think about questions um, do you know Donella Meadows? Uh, she was one of the early systems theorists. Uh, she was part of the people who wrote the book The Limits to Growth back in the 70s. Uh, she has a great book called Thinking in Systems that I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in systems thinking. And she has, uh, there's a famous article she wrote that's called Nine Ways to Intervene in a System in Diminishing Order of Effectiveness. Uh, and she talks about um, looking for the trim tabs, the pressure points, the places where you can make a small change. Permaculture, we say, least change for greatest effect. Uh, and different ways that you can intervene. Like you can intervene in the system around numbers. You can say, okay, you know, education is a problem. We're going to put more money into it. 
Sometimes that might help, but it's not going to actually change how the education is done or um, the thinking behind it. You can intervene around things like goals. You know, is the goal of our educational system to prepare students to go out and get a job, or is it to prepare our students to completely transform the system, or to invent completely new technologies, or to write great art? You know, if you intervene at the level of goals, it's going to have much more broad reaching effects than if you intervene at the level of numbers. And she's got, you know, like a, a lot of this, you know, you can intervene at the level of information. You know, she talks about a housing project in Holland, I think it was, where they discovered that when they had a meter at the front door, people could see every day that showed how much electricity they were using. That was the most important thing in conserving electricity. You know, with all the other systems are the same. If the meter was in the basement, people used more electricity than if it was right in the front hall because that information was constantly in their face. <laughs> you know, so we need to th do more thinking like that. And um, if we can do that thinking, then maybe we can. I, know, I don't know if we can or should ever come up with a thing of like, this is the one issue we all have to focus on. <laughs> but I think we can find ways of orchestrating the ways that we are focused on the different issues that call to us that reinforce each other instead of like pull attention away from each other. But there are moments like that, right? Yeah. Like the TPP or like these moments where everyone focused on the single leverage point is vital. And, I, and sometimes we seem to nail those moments, and other times we miss by a landslide. And, yeah. and, I've, and I find in the moments that we miss, there's precedents that get set that are hard to pull back from and to, to re rebuild or repair. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. Well, to follow on what you're saying, I think it's so important, the fifth estate, where the TPP and those sorts of important topics are being ignored by the media mm -hmm. to the point that they're disappearing. And as an example with uh, Trump wall-to-wall -wall coverage versus Bernie Sanders, the disproportionate representation of the media, I don't know if you have any ideas on how to strengthen the fifth estate. Amy Goodman's my heroine. Mm -hmm. But what do we do in the case where people aren't aware enough of what the TPP can do, so then we don't have the organizational power to activate them against it? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the whole theory around organizing. Like, um, why do you do direct action? Or why do you do demonstrations? Or why do you do, you know, actions of different sorts? Well, in part, it's because we've all got thousands of things clamoring for our attention. And if you do something strong and dramatic with an impact around an issue, it's a way of saying to people, hey, this is, you know, of all those things clamoring for your moment of time, this is something you should pay attention to. So there's like one theory of organizing says you need to educate people to organize them, and another that says, well, actually, you need to organize people in order to educate them, right? <laughs> and I think you kind of need to do both. Um, you know, on the one hand, the media has never been worse than it is now. Um, on the other hand, there's never been more opportunity to get something out to people than there is now without depending on the big corporate media. So it's a kind of mixed bag. You know, um, good old investigative reporting is just being throttled. <laughs> um, but, and un, you know, underfunded and defunded. Uh, but, you know, the internet is this tremendous place where you can get a message out. Um, you know, the problem is it can easily get drowned by 10,000 others. So figuring out how to do that um, is an art and a challenge. But it can be done. Yeah. I'd like to just speak to that also. I mean, you asked how do you reinforce and support, you know, the birthing of new media. 
and they just need to acknowledge you're doing that right now. You know, <laughs> you're you're yeah. supporting the creation of new media yeah. presently. Okay. You know, we're broadcasting live to people oh, yes. all over the place, yes. and stream of consciousness and tons of other new media mm -hmm. birthings are happening largely in response to the dysfunctional legacy media. You know, those polarities, like that polarity gives rise to people saying enough. You know, we need to create our own media. We need to get responsible for our own content. You know, I know as a consumer of media, I'm tired of the gross fear mongering, you know, monetized corporate media. Um, and so us taking cameras and, and using what's more and more accessible in technology and media to amplify people that are doing the most leading progressive work available um, is the pathway. And then for those that don't want to be inside that mix, mm -hmm. just look for opportunities to support it. You know, and, I, and I just wanted to acknowledge you because you're doing that now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love this discussion we're having. Uh -huh. It is so wonderful. Have you heard of um, Jaron Lapierre? He wrote the book, You Are Not a Gadget, and he talks mm -hmm. about creativity. And he talks about creativity in a way that, say you talk about legacy media, there's no more money in it because what we're doing here in this room is great, but then there's no investigative reporting because there's mm -hmm. no one to pay the journalists. So it's a really mm -hmm. important thing. And the importance of creativity is dwindling in a world when artists are not paid for <laughs> their work in any way that sustains them. So it's an open-ended question. I just wanted to respond to what you're doing is a great thing, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, how do we support the creativity? And what, you know, and... Or the artists, how do we support the artists? Yeah. I mean, with investigative journalism, I really encourage people to ask, put some money, you know, t toward it. There's certain things like, uh, Truth out and reader supported news that you know all this month they've been like on their begging for donations, <laughs> right? And I already donate something to them every month, you know. I actually I, I felt so guilty, I gave them some more, but you know, like th truth if out. truth out, yeah, and Hopefully reader supported the news, and and the national yeah. But yeah, if you read some of that stuff on the net, throw them some money because they need it. And if we can support, you know, independent journalism, uh, and we need to, you know, and people who do that work deserve to get paid for it and need to get paid for it so that they can focus on doing it and not, you know, waiting tables somewhere to support their journalism habit. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for your talk. You're, it's amazing. First time I've heard you. And on the discussion of media, I've had a lot of experience with it. And to be honest, the most influential change I've seen, and I loved hearing it in your book, was the children's uh, mm -hmm. leading the teaching. And I found the power of just going back to my own family and my children and, and, and helping them. And is that sort of the vision in your book that you see? Is that the hope is our kids, or is it the matriarchal point of view and get rid of men behaving badly? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in the book, uh, actually, in the, in the book, there's some men that behave pretty well. <laughs> <That's one. laughs> I mean, I always say, when the fifth sacred thing, I set out to write a book with a female heroine like a good feminist, and then Bird kind of came in and walked away with the story. <laughs> and uh, it was a, a, it was a fight to not let him just completely like take it away. <laughs> um, but I think the children definitely, you know, young like even if you look at the demographics, you know, as discouraging as it is to see Donald Trump getting the attention he's getting. The encouraging thing is like if we can survive this and wait long enough, those people are all dying off. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe they won't all like do us a favor like Scalia did and just drop dead. <laughs> But, you know, they're on the way out, and the younger people are all for Bernie Sanders, you know. Yeah. So if we can survive this long enough without the world going completely to hell in the meantime, 
eventually this change is coming. It's kind of like the change around gay rights and gay liberation that seemed so completely out there and impossible even 20 years ago. And all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, sure, of course, gay marriage. Like, you know, younger people, like, they don't care. <laughs> You know, so I think there is hope in that, and I think there also uh, is a lot of hope and wisdom in those of us in the older generation, uh, women and men, um, who have, you know, been kind of, you know, when you're, you've been around for a long time, you go through these phases, you see the waves come and go, uh, you know that whatever the particular political obsession is of the moment, uh, it's important, but it's also, it's passing. And you don't maybe take yourself quite as seriously as young people tend to do. So I think that wisdom is really necessary and that history is really necessary. You know, there's a period in my life for about seven years there where I kind of was like obsessively full force involved in the global justice movement after uh, the big blockade in Seattle and just kind of threw everything else aside to go to action after action and do trainings. And, and part of the reason I did that was I felt like there was this whole new generation of activists that were actually drawing on the work and on um, uh, forms that we had developed and processes we had developed over the past 20, 30 years, but who didn't know it. And that there needed to be somebody in there who actually held that history. And, um, you know, even if it involved like sort of hobbling after 20 something activists striding off down the streets <laughs> <laughs> desperately. <laughs> I feel like I spent seven years desperately trying to keep up with people who were much faster than me, right? <laughs> um, but I felt like, you know, it's important because especially, you know, we don't, we don't do a good job of teaching history in general. We especially don't do a good job of teaching activist history. Uh, so we can learn from some of those things. spirit and what role you think a personal or a communal spiritual practice has in the vision of the new world? Mm. Um, I like the definition of spirit that goes back to the root which is similar to the same root of like breath of respiration and inspiration and that part of the spirit. So it's like that animating force within us. Um, and I think that spirit has an important role to play because when we talk about things of the spirit, what we're talking about is our deep values. And for me, um, that goes to the root of politics and of activism and of community is that we build that community around our deep values. We take those actions, we organize because we hold some very deep core values that often go counter to, uh, counter to the way of the world. You know. uh, maybe we hold the core value that nature is sacred and we don't want to see it desecrated. You know, we hold the core value that human beings are sacred and that human diversity is a gift, and we don't want to see people oppressed because of their race or their gender or their uh, sexual orientation or some other extraneous fact about them. You know, um, I think also having some kind of communal spiritual practice is one way that we support ourselves and each other uh, because activism can be hard, and creativity can be hard in this world. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be discouraging. Uh, so to stay in it for the long haul, it really helps to have a community you can connect with that can constantly go back to those deep values, and that can give you support and give you encouragement 
and help uh, keep your own spirit from flagging. Hi, Starhark. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to thank you for being one of the great thinkers of our time. And just with the fifth sacred thing, you had so many wise concepts of the vision that we could create. And I, like you mentioned at the beginning of tonight, how important it is to have that vision in order to create it. And I'm just wondering, I thought at one point that I was seeing trailers for the fifth sacred thing and I'm just curious what happened to it becoming a movie because wouldn't that be a format that could really affect so many people on such a mass level hmm. where we can actually visualize what you've created into into actually creating a reality that is is a reflection of the positive aspects mm -hmm. because so many aspects of the fifth sacred thing you were actually quite prophetic in I mean, when you wrote it, I don't even know when, some of the things that you were talking about with water, we're actually seeing that happen now. Mm -hmm. um, that's a project that's still a project of bringing it to the screen. And uh, what you've seen is probably there's a, well, it's called a sizzle reel. It's not exactly a trailer, because a trailer's for a movie that's already been made. Uh, and the movie hasn't been made. We're still working on getting the right production company <coughs> and the right financing for it. Uh, but a sizzle reel is what you put together to encourage someone to make the movie. So uh, you can go to the fifthsacredthing.com uh, or to our Facebook page, and there's a trailer or a sizzle reel called One Act of Courage that has really some wonderful images in it of a possible future. Uh, and we're actually at the point of uh, shooting a new one with some real actors who've come on board. And um, I'm actually very hopeful that this project's going to move ahead this year and finally happen. It's been a long, frustrating, sometimes wonderful, sometimes <laughs> hair-pulling <laughs> <laughs> project, uh, navigating the labyrinth of Hollywood. <laughs> Yes, uh, we're pitching it probably more for a TV series than a movie at this point, because um, of the way the industry has gone, um, and also because then we could tell more of the story. That will be that would be further down the line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, right in front of you. Hi, Star. Hi. Um, you were saying in the beginning about hope and vision and how important those are. My sense with us activists is that vision is cool and vision leads you know, to clarity, clear intention, combined with energy, we get stuff done. I find that hope isn't all that cool. Like mm. people think hope isn't so good, isn't, isn't powerful somehow. And I'm just thinking about when <coughs> I, that's what I, my experience. <laughs> and um, when uh, our last federal election and one of the, one of the movements across the land was anything, anyone but Harper. Uh -huh. And uh, I, but I couldn't believe it when Justin Trudeau got, got in. And I was like walking down the street being giddy. I was like hopeful. <laughs> I was hopeful finally for my country. And, 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 yet, and yet, you know, maybe that's not, like, it, I, I just want to say, I think that it's sometimes hard for us to be hopeful because there's always some other activist in the room who's going, yeah, but there's all those things wrong that he's doing and he's going to mess this up and he's only promised that and he hasn't done it yet. And so, yeah. just a comment. <laughs> well, you know, hope, is, hope makes you vulnerable because you can be disappointed. Yeah. And cynicism is much safer because then you just, you know, but the problem is, if you're cynical, then you're just constantly disappointed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on the hope thing, because I recently sort of reframed that concept. Um, one, one of my teachers was, was talking about it. And when you, when you think of hope as something with a specific endpoint, that's when you get caught in the the hopelessness and, and there's there's it's an either or kind of conversation but if it's if it's just hope as a state of a way mm -hmm. of being it's a completely different 
way of engaging with the with the concept of hope that it's not about something specific that you're hoping for i hope i get a bicycle next week or whatever but it's just it's but a state of hope <laughs> um has worked better for me in terms of being visionary about things and so on hi star hi um in a lot of the activist communities and in a lot of the work that I'm doing in the world, and there seems to be uh, more dialogue around the importance of grief in activism mm -hmm. and the importance of first mourning what is happening so that we can be vital, so that we can stay mm -hmm. open. And activism is a very difficult thing. And we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of injustices and oppressions and marginalization happening. And um, I'm just curious how that maybe informs your work or what your thoughts are on, the, uh, on um, that part of being of activism is grieving the world um, that isn't right now. You know, my mother was an expert in loss and grief, um, not just personally because she was widowed very young, but she was a therapist and that was her field. And she wrote a really key book about it called *A Time to Mourn*. And um, you know, so I really learned a lot from her about. Uh, the power of grieving and the phases of grieving. And I think that it's really key and really vital uh, to allow ourselves to grieve for the things that we're losing. Um, because grief is a process. If you, if you go into it and you allow yourself to go through it, you come out re-energized on the other side. Um, and I think that is, you know, um, it goes, I think it goes hand to hand with hope and vision. You know, that if we ha have hope and vision, then we also can acknowledge what we're losing and what we're mourning. And if we stay in cynicism, then we really can't either fully grieve or fully hope. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to get back to um, something that you said earlier, uh, um, which was about, you know, if we only had time mm. um, for the for younger generation yeah. and for certain, uh, and for, you know, kind of a change of generation. And what I'm struggling with is this idea, is the, the problem that we don't, particularly with global warming, mm -hmm. And, and here, you know, on the state of the sea with ocean acidification, we don't have time. And that makes it very difficult yeah. to, um, to articulate a hopeful vision of change throughout our society rather than just, you know, focusing straight on keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Mm -hmm. and you know, getting out in the kayaks in Vancouver in, in two weeks to uh, to block the the, um, the tanker porn. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. And I, but I do think that there is an, some kind of need to envision what we would like to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll share a experience I had. I was invited, um, this was back in, I think, 2001 or 2002 to go to Brazil to an ecumenical conference. And, um, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to meet all these religious leaders and shamans and people down there. I think I'll ask them the question, like, do we have enough time to make the changes we need to make? And because it was an ecumenical conference in Brazil, one of the religious traditions there was Santo Daime. So they offered an ayahuasca ritual. Mm -hmm. So um, my friend and I went to the ritual. And I thought, this is a great place. I'll, you're supposed to go with the question. I'll go with the question. I went with the question and sat with the fire. And out of the fire, I said, you know, tell me, like, do we have enough time to make the changes we need to make? And the answer I got was no. 
<laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I asked, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then I heard, you know, but you're a witch and you can work outside of time. So part the curtains of time and plant the seeds of those changes in that timeless space where they've already come to fruition. And I go back to that vision a lot and think about that, um, you know, because yes, rationally and logically and stuff, we're way out of time, we're over time, but time is a construct and if we can step out of that time, uh, I actually believe there are great forces of resilience uh, in the world, in nature, in the earth, that actually want to work with us and want to see us get it together. And that if we do that, that we can actually slip through those little cracks in time and plant those changes and um, let them reverberate back. Um, and we need to do that. So sometimes that means, um, you know, Dina Metzger has a poem we used to sing back in the anti-nuclear days that said something like, um, there are those who want to set fire to the earth. We are in danger. There is only time to work slowly. There is no time not to love. So, um, Sometimes we need to take that time anyway. Um, you know, I'm not talking about like taking 10 years to sit and come up with our strategy, but we could take like an afternoon here and there, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Starhawk, you yeah. said that you began both uh, the Fifth Sacred Thing and the City of Refuge with your question. Mm -hmm. Is there a question that you would like us to ponder? as we read your book and consider the future you have proposed? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I would like people to really hold that same question I have been asking with City of Refuge is how do we build that new world when people are so damaged by the old? And how do we heal that damage enough to be able to work together effectively to make those changes. And what is the part each one of us is called to play in that? Hi, Starhawk. Thank you so much for being here. Um, since doing my permaculture course four or five years ago has changed my, my whole life. Mm -hmm. And um, I really come back a lot to the principles and start to see the principles in my everyday life. And uh, I see you as a person who's really kind of like bringing s more of the spiritual energy into permaculture, where sometimes really earth, earth folk. Um, so I guess I was wondering about kind of some like spiritual permaculture principles and how to get the, the permies more into your, into your visioning world. You know, I think the core understanding in permaculture to me is exactly the same as the core understanding in at least what I think of spirituality is that deep understanding that everything is interconnected and that we are all interconnected. We are all part of this living being, living system, um, that everything is in relationship. And to be a, a good permaculture designer is to learn to think in relationships. Uh, maybe it's relationships of, you know, the microorganisms to the plants in the garden, or the way the plants in the garden relate to each other, or the relationship of the way you cite your house to the sun and the heat and the wind and the rain. Uh, but that's really what it's all about. And that, to me, is also what spirituality is about, is understanding that everything is in relationship and we are all in relationship. Uh, so it's not so much bringing permaculturists around to that point of view. It's just offering opportunities to celebrate it, I think, and uh, connect around it in multiple forms. Um, 
you know, I've taught permaculture in a lot of different places. And when I teach, like we're teaching up at our eco village uh, for the next two weeks, we usually begin every morning with ritual and ceremony, and we do a weave a lot of that in. Uh, when I taught in Palestine, we had, you know, students who were, some of whom were kind of secular Palestinians, some of whom had actually lived in the Bay Area and been part of uh, some of our rituals there, some of whom were really devout, strict Muslims. And it wasn't, and the guy who, who, uh, who sort of is the, the director of the farm and the program is a very devout Muslim. So it wasn't a situation where we could just like rip off our clothes and start dancing around the moon, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but what I did was every morning I would lead people through a little bit of a meditation just to get into a state where you could observe and send them out to observe, um, sometimes just to observe and wonder about something in nature, sometimes maybe to observe patterns or observe energy flows, all those things that are very practical things we deal with in permaculture, but actually created that same opportunity to have a spiritual moment of just being outside, being in deep connection with all the forces around you. So I think there are many ways we can bring that in. And they don't always need to be labeled spirit or labeled ritual. Um, but they can, if we go back again to say, how do we allow people to have a deep emotional experience of interconnection here? Uh, then we can find those ways to make that present. Hi, Star. Hi. In the fifth sacred thing, that line, um, there is a place for you at my table, uh, is so powerful. And I was wondering, over the last 20 years, if you've heard any stories of people using a line, that line, or a line like that, that people have shared with you, and if you could share one with us. Um. You know, it seems to me I hear that line or hear variations of it pop up a lot. Um, I'm trying to think specifically about a particular story. You know, I think it's a story not so much about that particular line, but it was something I experienced when I was in Palestine. Uh, I was there at the time in 2002 with a group called the International Solidarity Movement that was supporting nonviolent resistance in the occupied territories. It still is. And we had um, gone into this refugee camp called Balata, which is right on the outskirts of the city of Nablus, uh, when it was under siege by the Israeli army, and they had all the men were sort of gone. They had arrested all the men and taken them away, and there was really no one left in the camp but women and children. And we had gone there to sort of be a presence and a witness and to uh, try to intervene if necessary in some helpful way. Um, and the soldiers came back. And at one point we were staying with a family, and uh, it was uh, the women, and they had a little boy who was about four years old. And the soldiers had come in, and they had searched the house, like, really brutally. Like, they locked us all in a bedroom uh, for several hours while they just literally tore the house apart and ripped the paneling off the walls, you know, just or threw everything out of the closets just completely, like, tore the house apart, and um, it was a couple of days after that, and the soldiers came back, and the little boy saw this Israeli soldier and, like, started screaming and crying because he was so afraid. And what his mother did was um, 
she talked to the soldier and she lifted her little boy up and she got the soldier to kiss, the, the little boy give him a kiss. And she said she did that because she didn't want her child to be afraid. And to me that was the spirit of that, you know, thing that it's about you know, it's about being able to extend yourself beyond some of your limits. Not necessarily, you know, really because you understand that to do that is to step beyond your own fear and to create a world in which other kinds of things are possible. So Thank that you. for me was a really powerful moment. Um, I was thinking a little bit about what something that was mentioned earlier, and it was uh, Jason brought up the the idea that we've got so many different movements going on and so many things to look at. And I thought about I've been thinking lately about clay clot a lot, and mm -hmm. noticing that a lot of people I meet that are st that are working so hard, especially um, that have been around for a long time and keep going, uh, we're at clay clot, and it always surprises me. And I was wondering if you would want to speak to that, and if that in if winning or succeeding in those instances keeps the energy going and, and what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was at Clay Quad at one point. <laughs> yeah. well, don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's okay, you're not live to the world right now. Yeah. So we're hoping like this sort of just disappears out of the consciousness of the legal records and everything else, right? But and the yeah. star, you're on the internet right now. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't believe everything you hear. Yeah. It's just <laughs> uh, but actually, my partner and I and three of his daughters had gone there to sort of support the blockade and offer a ritual and do some things when we were up um, when that summer. And Joanna Macy came, and she did a workshop on overcoming fear. And by the end of it, Let's just say there's a, a, a vile and probably untrue rumor that the whole, we went as a whole family and blockaded and got arrested, <laughs> <laughs> leading to our family motto, the family that is detained together remains <laughs> together. <laughs> But I think, you know, there are those actions like Clayoquot. Um, in California, it was Diablo Canyon. Um, you know, those things that really not only change your life, but change the whole culture of activism. I mean, uh, Diablo Canyon was a blockade back in 81 at a nuclear power plant that uh, was built on an earthquake fault. And there were like 5,000 arrests over that summer. And at the end of it, an engineer revealed that they had these two, you know, twin plants that were supposed to be mirror images of each other. And that in building them, they'd mixed up the plans and built some of the parts of the plants backwards. Mm -hmm. And it took them another four years to <laughs> straighten it all out. Um, eventually, it did go online. It's now like been online long enough that now it's due to be decommissioned, and now there's a new movement because they, of course, want to extend its operating license, and there's a very strong movement building now to decommission it finally. Um, but again, sometimes the victories aren't always so clear. Like, even though that plant went online, the opposition was so strong and so costly to Pacific Gas and Electric that they had 50 other nuclear power plants on the drawing board that got canceled because they had so much trouble getting, getting Diablo online. Um, and that, you know, that movement shaped you know, movements around, you know, we went on from that blockade to do a lot of actions around nuclear weapons at Livermore Weapons Lab where the US designs and develops nuclear weapons around Vandenberg Air Force Base. 
uh, around the Nevada test site. And some of the people who were involved in those movements were also involved in organizing Seattle uh, in 99 and in shaping the global justice movement. So these things have immense impacts. Um, and I think that people who go through an experience like that and have that experience of what it's like to be in a massive movement of people organizing together and succeeding in doing something very powerful, um, it does really change your life. It can turn you into a lifelong activist. Um, there's, you know, there's really no other feeling quite like it. Uh, I think some people got that feeling through the Occupy movement more recently. Uh, I think for other people, I think the Occupy movement, it sort of like took pieces of this model that had worked really well in those earlier movements, um, but it left some key pieces out. <laughs> because of that, <laughs> right? It, it was sort of like an ecosystem missing a few keystone species. Right? <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of people also found it very frustrating and discouraging. Uh, but I do know people whose lives were completely changed by Occupy and, you know, who were, com you know, one of my former housemates who'd been stuck in a job he hated for years and years and years and finally the Occupy movement got him out of it and into a whole new phase of life, so. So one of the questions I have, and I think that um, taking your permaculture design course last year really gave me kind of hope that with you know the devastation of deforestation on the planet, there there is perhaps a way we can win and reforest the planet. So if you could uh, share with us some of your vision about that, would be great. Yeah, I think one of the pieces of organizing I've been working on this last year has been in the permaculture movement, organizing a group on permaculture solutions to climate change. <coughs> and we actually uh, formed at the International Permaculture Convergence in England um, last fall and are working on getting a website and developing trainings um, for people around the permaculture solutions. Because uh, there are solutions and they do involve regenerating landscape on a large scale, and there are some, you know, a few key approaches to doing that. One is reforestation. Uh, well, actually, one is like stopping the deforestation. <laughs> yeah, right. If you've got old growth somewhere, if you've got pristine forests, or you've got even healthy second growth forests, like, you know, if you've got ancient trees, there's so few of them left, like don't cut them down. <laughs> Leave them, we need them. You know. uh, then there's reforestation, like actually replanting and regenerating and managing forests sustainably. Um, and you can, you know, you can manage a forest sustainably, you can improve the health of the forest, and you can still harvest things that people need. Um, but you, if you do that consciously and sustainably, you can end up with, uh, you know, there's a forester near us who has managed this piece of land for something like 20 years, and I think he's taken out something, thousands and thousands of board feet of lumber, and he has more board feet of lumber growing now than he did to begin with. <laughs> and it's not that hard to do. <laughs> Uh, then there's growing food using perennial systems and food forests and no-till agriculture and lots of different techniques where you're not plowing up the ground and turning it over all the time and exposing all that soil to air and oxidizing all the carbon, but building soil, building carbon, um, putting more carbon from the atmosphere back into the dirt where it belongs. And then there are grazing techniques, um, holistic management, rotational grazing, where you 
move herds around in bunches and move them really often. So they mimic the way that grazers behave in nature in the presence of predators. And grasslands and grazers co-evolved. So a lot of grasslands, especially in dry lands or brittle environments that don't get rain throughout the year, they actually need that animal impact. They need the disturbance in order to trample the grass down and get it contact with the earth so it can actually rot instead of standing there and just desiccating. <laughs> Um, they need the poop and the pee and the fertility and um, the hoof action, all of that. So you can mimic that by moving the herd. You know, instead of letting the animals stay there and graze forever, you move them really often. So they eat and then they move and they don't come back until the grass has time to recover. And it's a very powerful way of building soil very quickly. Uh, it also has the advantage that if fire comes through, fire comes through a forest and takes out all those trees that you've replanted. Fire comes through a grasslands, the bulk of that biomass is in the soil and remains there. Um, you know, so those are just a few of some of the many, many techniques that we can use to regenerate the land. And when we do that, we have this great capacity, I think, to start shifting and <coughs> interrupting this negative cycle and start shifting it back to a uh, positive direction. I'm not sure what our timing is, but I'm... Uh, you have okay, great. Hi, sir. I have another question. Uh -huh. Talking about activism, I'm in the internet world mm -hmm. and trying to do some stuff there. Um, I'm really curious about your thoughts on around clicktivism, if you've heard that term. Uh, what? Clicktivism. <laughs> clicktivism. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's got, this is how I'll define it, it's got a negative connotation, I uh -huh. would say, around um, how you can go online and say, sign a petition by clicking or doing other quick and um, I would think some people would say shallow activist movements. And I think the connotation goes further to, um, to where people, it might stop people from going further because they mm -hmm. think, okay, well, I've done this. But I'm wondering, yeah, what, what your thoughts around this? It affects my work, so I'm curious. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it might stop people from going further, but it might also encourage someone who's never done anything to do something and take the first step. Um, I don't think it's, you know, it doesn't have the impact of like actually going to a demonstration or actually calling your elected representative or actually sending a handwritten or a typed letter. But I wouldn't say that it has no uh, impact. It can have some impact. If for anything, it has an impact in informing people of something that's going on and making them feel some connection to it in that they've done something about it. Um, so I would say it has its place, but it's definitely not enough. <laughs> Hi, Starhawk. Hi. <laughs> After taking your permaculture course in 2014, I went on a whirlwind ride of activism. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, and I was on Burnaby Mountain for eight nights sleeping under a tarp with a bunch of other wet, stinky, smelly people that hadn't <laughs> bathed in days. And while I was up there, we found that the best way to throw the RCMP off or the bad guys off was to come at them with love. Mm -hmm. and cookies and warm soup and the things that they weren't getting on the top of a mountain and we were because mm -hmm. the community was hiking up there and bringing it to us. Uh -huh. So what I found is that we started learning and teaching each other what the solutions were. And as mm -hmm. we started finding more and more solutions to the problems, and I used a bunch of your permaculture mm -hmm. courses, we had a, a river running through our tarp, so we ended up <laughs> slowing it down by building little swales. And then we had <laughs> little rocks in it. Then we had like crystals in it. It was really uh -huh. cool. We had a pathway that the RCMP said just through that was full of mud. We ended up laying down branches from all the dead trees that were in the bushes and, and made this lovely little boardwalk. Uh -huh. Every single time they tried to make our life miserable, mm -hmm. we improved it with permaculture. Uh -huh. It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> 
So <laughs> what I've been finding is in this action movement that I'm in now yeah. is if I don't come in, I can come in going stop. Yeah. But if you don't have a go, people yeah. aren't going to listen to you. So we have to come in with a stop. Well, mm -hmm. here's the solution. This is what we can do. I'm dealing with this toxic soil in Shawnigan Lake right mm -hmm. now. I know one of the solutions is, is, well, don't dig it up right now. <laughs> and if you have dug it up and it's sitting on a barge somewhere in the ocean, let's try throwing some oyster mushrooms on it. Let's try throwing some, some bacteria on it, tarping it, and seeing what happens. Yeah. But they don't listen to that because they're so stuck in their dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. So a young, ch a young girl uh, said to me, you've got to speak to them in their language. Mm -hmm. They only hear dollars and cents. They don't understand common sense. So if you can find a way to bring your proposals to them in a mm -hmm. way that says, here's what you can do in exchange of doing what you're doing right now, which is poisoning our watershed, you can do this and you can end up with soil, a commodity at the end mm -hmm. that you can then use to replant clear cuts mm -hmm. and to fix up the, the, the roadways, et cetera, et cetera, without having to just, uh, run, right now they're just digging and dumping above us. So I've been for the last two years since they've been digging and dumping, doing the oyster mushrooms around the base uh -huh. of it. I was up there this spring ba bashing in willow mm -hmm. and um, we're now um, getting water tests so we know exactly what toxins we're dealing with so we know exactly what plants to do. The floating gardens are being moored in the creek. Um, mm -hmm. We've been doing a bunch of restoration, but we have to be able to see, as you said, the vision. When I was yeah. on Burnaby Mountain, I met an elder up there that told me we all have to work on our third eye envisioning the future as we want to see it because that's the way collectively we're going to raise the vibration of this planet so that we can see what we want to see and we've all been dumbed down by fluoride and GMOs and chemtrails and all the mm -hmm. stuff they throw at us so we really have to work on exercising our pineal glands and she says start with something small imagine a jelly bean mm. <laughs> she doesn't work your way up and then as you get to the bigger <laughs> visions the bigger visions show up right yeah. every time i envisioned a jelly bean i can guarantee a jelly bean showed up on burnaby mountain it was so <laughs> weird so we have to be able to with the yeah. actions we have to be able to come in with solutions yeah and we have to come in with the visions to fix what we're doing because otherwise they're not going to stop doing what they're doing yeah but thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> So glad to hear you've put that knowledge to good use. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I just uh, to speak to that. I, I was speaking with a colleague of mine, and um, she said that uh, I was working with fire and mitigation, and she was saying that you know we, uh, permaculture kind of side tries to uh, communicate. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's really hard without the uh, uh, the research behind it. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually a big move within permaculture now to start documenting the research. Uh, that was another thing that came out of the uh, convergence in England last year. There's a journal that's being put together that will be a peer-reviewed research journal. Uh, there's an international research permaculture research group that's forming and there are a lot of people who have backgrounds in things like agroecology and the academic background that can put that research into a form that um, it can um, yeah, speak to those experts. Um, on the, the permaculture climate change solutions org uh, it's the permacultureclimatechange.org. We've got some resources up there. Uh, there's a book that was put together in Portugal, mostly for the European Union, but for policymakers on some of these techniques um, that has a lot of good documentation and research behind it. And Eric Tonsmeyer uh, is supposed to be releasing his book uh, sometime this spring on climate change solutions, and he's got a lot of great research and documentation around that. So uh, I think there's a, a really awareness of that, that you know, you do have to sometimes speak to the policymakers in that language that um, they may or may not really understand, but they think bears weight. <laughs> and there are some things like in California, 
you know, there is uh, the Marin Carbon Institute that's been doing a lot of work on soil and regeneration. Uh, there was someone who did a study that showed that applying compost to fields can not only improve the grassland, um, but could actually improve the carbon sequestrations really significantly. Uh, and that encouraged the San Francisco city government to start thinking about taking our compost and putting it out in the ranchers' fields and making an alliance with them. Uh, Vandana Shiva has been also doing a lot of work around what she calls soil, not oil. And um, she's got a lot of good resources on that, too. So there are good things that are out there. I wanted to answer the clicktivist. Mm -hmm. um, while we were up on the mountain, and I did this last spring when the toxic soil was first being brought in, I would sit in front of the pit where it was coming into and I would record all the vehicles, all the trucks, all the businesses that were coming in to that pit and I would post them on Facebook with a picture and their phone number. And then the clicktivists that were sitting at home on their computers that couldn't be up on the top of a rainy mountain with me could then call those companies and say, mm, we're not going to deal with you anymore. Mm. I used to have you used to pump my septic tank every year, but since you're dealing with these guys, I'm not going to do that anymore. And what ended up happening is that these guys lost so much business they couldn't find truckers to move their dirt anymore because companies were dropping out left, right, and center because people were literally driving down the highway and you know giving them the finger as they passed them. So they found that that was a little uncomfortable for themselves. So the clicktivists, if you organize your action properly and you get the names and numbers, because everybody that's doing yeah. this has names, numbers, corporations, and faces, and if you take the time to email them, call them, um, say hi to them if you know them on the street and say, hey, you know, you really shouldn't be working with these guys. They're doing a really bad thing. Know your facts, speak your truth, and for most part, the shaming, <laughs> is the only way I could describe it, um, <laughs> makes them back off because they don't want to be looked at like the bad guys. Um, most, most people I find intentionally don't want to be looked at as the bad guys. Mm -hmm. It's just something they're stuck in that position. And a lot of these guys, that's where they were. So the collectivist can do huge ways that way because I'm on the top of the mountain, I don't have data. So I'm, I'm just putting out the picture and then you guys are off and running. And it worked because we had uh, 17 trucking companies that pulled out and are now publicly wow. saying, we will not work with this company. They're now using it as a promo wow. for themselves. <laughs> that they won't work with these guys. <laughs> so so yeah. the connection here is that the people that are in the background are just as important, if not more important, than us standing in front of the trucks out there because mm -hmm. we can only stop them on one front. You guys can stop them on so many, and I call it the non-compliance. So those people that are doing all this stuff, we're just not gonna comply with them anymore. And it, we're not gonna buy their bullshit, and we're just gonna say, no, it's time to change our ways, and, mm -hmm. and you guys have either gotta go with us or you're gonna be left behind. Um, as my friend Audrey says, uh, step up or step back. Mm. Hi. First of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you. Hold it. Thank, thank you, you for yeah. um, teaching my son. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he taught him permaculture a few years ago. I don't know. Was 2014. 14, yeah. Uh -huh. In Shawnigan. And um, it takes a community to raise your <laughs> children, that is for sure. And I homeschooled mm -hmm. for a lot of uh, the years. And um, just want to speak a little bit about hope and faith and trust since that word did come up. And for me, just my experience in creating my reality, um, hope is actually not a part of that. Mm. I simply just believe in faith and trust and knowing that uh, if you stay strong in your vision and you visualize what you want, it shows up. And hope is just a false mm. creation or illusion. So that's my little piece on that. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to say that and say thank you. Today my son is actively involved with permaculture and making a lot of great changes with um, the environment, oh using your great. skills. And uh, what he thought mom was so witchy is now <laughs> part of his life, <laughs> which is really great to see that he uses all the knowledge that uh, he's learning. So thank you for oh, that. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello. I just want to kind of talk what you were about what you were talking about. I took my PDC about almost 10 years ago and have been working with uh, water management. I have my own landscaping company, and this year with uh, standing up for the water at Shawinigan Lake, um, I do a lot of stone work and patio work, and um, my client wanted a bunch of slate, so I, I said, yeah, but I'm not going to deal with this company because they deal with that. Yeah. And, and huh? I watched it. She was like, oh, yes, and then she told her friend, and then <laughs> they told her friend. And they were telling people over the fence, they're like, she didn't go to this, she found this other place. And <laughs> it's like the word of mouth that spreads when you get to stand up uh -huh. instead of, you know, and I was really proud that the people in the city were standing up as well, and how that just goes, goes oh, out yeah. and, and flourishes and ripples everywhere. Something that jumps up for me in this conversation of hope, which I think about a lot, is how I think that hope can be can show up in a lot of different ways. And <coughs> sometimes when things are hopeless or when you can't see the path, um, variations of hope or faith or trust can serve because we can still take steps towards it even if we don't comprehend how it might mm -hmm. work. <coughs> right now I'm watching that happen in the States with Bernie where a lot of people in math say it doesn't work and some people say it can still work, but Bernie's like, I will continue taking steps and, you know, and, um, and so a lot of people move with him. Where I find hope breaks down often is that hope can be a replacement for responsibility. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people talk hope and take no action mm -hmm. or, or take action that they they somehow know is very diluted or, you know, isn't particularly impactful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from my part, like, I, I often look, like, where am I being hopeful instead of making a phone call or going to an event mm -hmm. or hosting something or whatever? Um, and I, it frustrates me because often I meet with people who talk great talk and their hearts are clearly in the right place, like, you know, no, no diminishment of, of where they're coming from but they speak of hope and can't or don't um, show up at an event or buy the book or support the author or kind of whatever that is. And I, I often, I would welcome your thoughts about activating people that are coming from hope and not action. Well, definitely you should buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I feathered that in there, yeah. because I really hope I don't end up carrying them all <laughs> around. <laughs> uh, but I would say, again, like the magical teaching is like if you want something and you want to create something, you visualize it, you hold it in your mind, and then you put energy behind it. That energy isn't just like spiritual energy, it's also practical energy, <laughs> right? So like you want a clean Shawnigan Lake you know, you put energy behind that in a lot of different ways, uh, including maybe sitting up on the mountain, you know, <laughs> right? And if you put energy, like the amount of energy you put sitting up on the mountain is huge. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, it's giving weight to that vision in a way that just sitting at home and thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a clean Shawnigan Lake. Gee, I hope that happens. <laughs> we'll never quite do so. And then, because it's huge, it can mobilize those other energies, like the energy of that decision not to deal with that company, or the energy of making that phone call. You know. So. Hi again. Um, I don't know how these things work, <laughs> but at lunch today in my office lunchroom, we got to discussing many things about matriarchal cultures <laughs> and the evolution of things. Um, and I invoked uh, the fifth sacred thing, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing that you were here, not knowing, <laughs> not knowing that this was happening. Wow. So I'm, I'm feeling blessed to, to be in your company again. Uh -huh. um, the last time um, I worked with you, um, we talked a great deal about affinity <laughs> and about establishing those types of relationships that are nurturing and sustaining. And so I just wanted to invoke that word again. I hadn't heard it yet in this room. And, um, 
as a, an older man now, um, reflect on the generational nature of change and uh, the, the spiral nature of, <laughs> of our experience and how the same questions and the same challenges come around in a different moment, in a different guise. But the lessons that we learn and that we share in our affinity groups and in our families and in our work relationships, in fact, when the cracks open up and the opportunity presents, mm -hmm. are indeed how uh, we advance. And uh, call that hope, call that faith, call that trust, I, it's happening and it's manifesting. And uh, I want to also invite you to remember uh, that isolation and, uh, uh, is one of the, the killers of, of spirit and hope. Mm. There are many people that I'm sure would love to be here tonight but can't for reasons of infirmity or responsibility mm -hmm. or... Um, so uh, reach out to those people who you know would have been enriched mm -hmm. and, and touched by this conversation and invite them closer to your, to your sense of common purpose and, and affinity. Speaking of which, I wonder if there are any questions coming in from people who are live streaming. Yeah, let's invite that. So yeah. uh, if you're watching the live stream and you're joined us on the Facebook page, please hop on there and share any questions you have and we'll translate those back mm -hmm. and give Star a chance to speak to those. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, f that's the event page for tonight's event. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. So, um, I was just wondering, because as a young person these days, I'm finding it very overwhelming with everything that's going on. And like, I, I'm only 18. <laughs> I haven't even started like my life yet, I feel. Um, and, but I find it hard to function <laughs> mm -hmm. these days, let alone do something. So I was just wondering suggestions around how to just deal with the overwhelm, how to filter, how to just kind of figure, figure, figure out the system mm -hmm. before you figure out how to change it. Um, you know, I always tell the story many years ago, I was walking with my friend Mary and we were out in this place, uh, it was, you know, a beautiful little canyon, but it was just covered with garbage and trash. And, um, you know, Mary just said, like, here, have a plastic bag. And she said, like, whenever I come here, um, I always just pick up the cans that are in my path. I know I can't clean the whole place up. I can't even really make a dent in it. But I pick the ones that, like, are in my path. And I always thought that is a really good model for dealing with overwhelm. Mm -hmm. You know, like if we look at the whole thing, yeah, like we can't deal with it all, but we can pick up the cans that are in our path. And if mm -hmm. we all do that, then those paths will intersect and we'll start to make a difference in it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to possibly read one last thing to close with. It's uh, <laughs> the very end of the book, a little piece from Maya's journals. For my part, if I could, I would declare a general amnesty for all of us everywhere. Forgive our debts and our mistakes, our missteps and failings and betrayals, even our occasional or devoted cruelties, all the ways we play out our inner torment on one another. We are wounded creatures, all of us, bashing away with bloody limbs. We never had a chance to be anything else. Forgive it all and start anew. Let us forgive all the ways we wander in circles, take the wrong path. We all lose the way. Let it go and know that all you have to do, really, is just to come back. 
Stand up again when you fall. When you can't see ahead, grope your way back to the trail. That's all we ask, all we can ask. Not perfection, but course correction. Not a symphony, but a few notes pulled from the air and shaped into something with meaning. A song, however simple, even if you forget the words and flub the harmony, even if you think it makes no difference. Just sing. Be on the side of the makers and shapers, the singers and the storytellers. That's all you need to do. Not to sing with the voice of an angel, but however cracked and broken your instrument, sing anyway. Oh,